I recently saw a couple of pictures of Brother Robert R. Taylor Jr. as a younger man, and I just got to thinking today as we approach the end of this lectureship and all that he's done since his time of preaching. He started in 1949, and what if you had said to this young preacher back then, in your lifetime as a preacher, you will write this many articles, you will contribute this many chapters to books, you will write this many books of your own. As you comment on the scriptures, you will make this many hospital visits, attend this many surgeries, preach this many funerals or weddings, etc., etc. You'll preach uh, in these many places. If they had told him as he started all that he would do, I'm sure it would have sounded pretty exhausting. But he has just done it in steady fashion, day by day, week by week, month by month, and year after year until here we are. And how many of us have been immeasurably blessed because that young man did all those things for the glory of God and to the glory of the church that Jesus died for. And so I'm so grateful tonight that we've been a major part of uh, Brother Taylor's preaching life as far as his contribution of written material and lectures. And I believe he told me one time, if I heard him correctly, that he has uh, attended every lectureship at the Memphis School of Preaching, except for maybe two, uh, three, that uh, he was not able to attend. And so he's been a part of this work uh, just since its beginning. And we love him for his work's sake for the gospel, and for the man that he is, it's my privilege to have Brother Robert R. Taylor, Jr. now come and address the subject, When Your Journey is Completed. Thank you so much, Brother B.J. Some words of gratitude that I want to express in the very beginning of my lesson First of all, to the elders of this congregation for overseeing not only this great and good work, but so many other works as well. My thanks to Keith and all connected with the school for the inv invitation to come and speak again. I've been doing this since uh, uh, the spring of 1970, and it's always been one of the chief highlights of my life. There's so many of you that have expressed sentiments of sadness and words of comfort to me over the passing of my lovely lady, and of course I miss her greatly. I want to thank every one of you for the comfort and for the sustaining sympathy that you have expressed to me. I never was, I, ne I always was amazed at her wit. It always surprised me some of the things that came out of her mouth. At times I would say, honey, do you always know what you're going to say? At times she would confess, no, I really don't. <laughs> one of her favorite stories, and then I'll get into the lesson assigned to me, is one that she enjoyed telling. We were in a gospel meeting in a certain location, and one of the area preachers, not a member of that congregation, but a young man, after coming three or four times to the meeting, he came up to Irene one night and he said, I want you to tell me the secret about how Brother Taylor can get in the pulpit night after night and preach without notes. She suggested, well, it has come from long years of study on a daily basis. He said, no, no, I don't, I don't want to hear that. I want to know the secret. And so in characteristic fashion, Irene spun this story. She said, well, you see, here's the secret of it. I hold up cue cards for him. <laughs> and he immediately said, I didn't see you holding up any cue cards. Irene said, well, you don't think I'd show them to the audience, do you? <laughs> and he about halfway believed her, and then she had to go into a convincing argument that she was just kidding with him. Thank you for being present tonight. When, I, my, when our journey, or your journey, is completed, 
She read the manuscript before I sent it in last spring, and neither one of us realized that before its presentation tonight, that one of us uh, would complete the earthly journey. And she did on January the 12th this past uh, winter. And uh, I prayed for her recovery, but not if she had to spend her days and weeks as she did the last few weeks and the last few months of her life, suffering so very, very much. Thank you for the love that you showered upon her and upon me. When your journey is completed, there are important numbers that are found in the Bible all the way from Genesis through the book of, uh, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. In fact, the fourth book of the Bible is named Numbers. And there are certain numbers that are key numbers. Twelve is one of those numbers. We remember the twelve tribes and then the 12 minor prophets, and then the 12 apostles. Seven, I believe, is one of the major numbers of the Bible. I believe it's the key number in the book of Revelation. But also, two is a major number within the Bible. We have two testaments that make up the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have two manners of life that of the spirit and that of the flesh. We have two masters that we can serve, one the Christ, the other Satan, the devil. There are two ways to travel, and Jesus described them in Matthew the seventh chapter 13 and 14. One is the broad way and the other the narrow way. There are two destinations at the end of these two journeys, or these two roads of travel. One is life, everlasting in nature, and the other is destruction, eternal perdition. There are two major things that happen to us at the time of our passing. As accountable people, we will die in the Lord or we will die outside the Lord. There will be two resurrections come that final day. Jesus spoke about them in, in John the 6th chapter, 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. There will be the resurrection of the unjust, the evil, the wicked, the profane, and then the resurrection of the righteous, the faithful. There will be two groups that will stand in judgment. They will occupy two locations. One will be on the judge's left hand. The other will be on the judge's right hand. One will hear uh, the word come, and the other will hear the word depart. And there really is as much difference between heaven and hell as there is between that welcome come and that dreaded depart. There will be so many twos that we could name within the Bible. When your journey is completed, that necessitates the beginning of this journey. Before we became members of the church as accountable people, we were without Christ, we were without hope, we were not members of the commonwealth of Israel, we were in sin and transgression and trespasses. But upon obedience to the gospel, hearing the wonderful words of life, and believing from the heart, the depths of our heart, that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God, leading us to repent of every sin, every transgression of which we've been guilty, and then using our mortal tongue, confessing the name that is so grand and gracious and wonderful and lovely. And then upon our baptism and immersion in water, we step from the outside where there's been damnation and condemnation. We come to the glorious inside where there is redemption, where there is forgiveness, where there is pardon, where there is sonship to God Almighty. And what a wonderful thing it is to be a child of God. John, that disciple whom Jesus loved, greatly appreciated uh, what it meant to be the Son of God. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. That word sons inclusive, is inclusive of male and female. 
And so that's the beginning of our journey. That's not the end of our earthly journey. We're just uh, getting a beginning. And then stretching out before us uh, is the wonders of the Christian life. There are four W's uh, that I believe sum up so much in the way of Christian living. One of these is uh, wait, one of these is watch, one of these is work, and one of these is worship. And the Bible has so much to say about all of these. Jesus, uh, near the end of his own line, in the gentleness of Gethsemane, called upon the apostles to watch and pray, assuring them that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. There are so many passages in the Bible encouraging us to work. God Almighty is a worker. Jesus Christ, as the eternal word, is a worker. In fact, he said, while he was here upon the earth, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. The apostles were workers. The prophets of the Old Testament were workers. And we are encouraged. We are obligated to work. Near the end of the great resurrection chapter, one of the truly victorious uh, chapters that came from Paul's prolific pen, he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, I beseech you, and he then, then he told them to abandon the work of the Lord, knowing that in the work of the Lord, your labor is not going to be in vain. Three times in Titus, the third chapter, John, or rather Paul, through, through Titus, encourages the people to be ready unto every good work. And then there is the beauty of worship. I'm fond of a statement that is found in Psalm 29 and verse 2 about the beauty of worshiping God or worshiping God and the beauty of holiness and giving him the proper glory. Jesus, uh, as he conversed with a woman at Jacob's well, suggested in John 4 and 24, God is a spirit, quite literally, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Then the Bible encourages us to be a waiting people, waiting in the fullness of faithfulness, waiting in the fullness of preparation. The five wise virgins were waiting for the coming of the bridegroom that night, and they were in watchful readiness. The five foolish virgins, even though they came, and even though they brought a little bit of oil, not a sufficiency of readiness, not a sufficiency of preparation. Therefore, they were not accepted and welcomed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these are four important W's that sum up so well the living of the Christian life. We are told within the Bible what we are to leave off, what we are to mortify. The Apostle Paul suggested various works of the flesh of which we are not to be a participant, of which we are not to be a part. Those are listed in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. The Bible encourages us to put on the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, against such there is no law. That's found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The Apostle Paul suggested in writing to Titus, and this would be one of the final books that he penned before his own journey came to an end upon the earth. He suggested that uh, the, 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 the grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Here we're told how not to live, by those two expression, and then we're told positively how to live. To live soberly, and to live soberly means to live right with oneself. To live righteously means to live right with other people, before other people. And living godly means to live right in the sight of Jehovah God, Jesus Christ his Son, and the Spirit of Holiness. Here we find the great challenge of inward living and upward living and outward living. And that sums up so well the Christian religion. The Apostle Peter, in the last epistle that he wrote, we know that to be Second Peter, 
early in that epistle, he said, and beside this giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity or love. Second Peter 1 verses 5, 6, and 7. He assures us that if these things are within us and abound, they make us that we are going to be sure winners come judgment day, that we'll be able to enter that heaven upon high. And so here we have obligations as we live and continue our journey upon the earth. But ultimately, there comes the time when every one of us is going to leave this earth. And if Jesus Christ delays his coming just a little bit longer, every one of us will do as everyone in the past except Enoch and Elijah. We will pay nature's last debt. We will go the way of all of the earth, as David one time expressed it, and as Joshua one time expressed it. There will come the day when we will make a departure. Paul knew that day was dawning upon him in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, the last of the 100 chapters that he penned for the New Testament. He said, I'm ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have, I have I've made the journey. I have finished my course. Henceforth, there is later for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me in that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. But a person's journey, who is a righteous person, does not end with death. The atheist has to say it does end with death. They believe that we're just like the dog or the cat or the cow, the cow, that when we're dead, we're gone and there's no more for us in the future. But that's not the legacy. That's not the holy heritage that we have as the children of God. We know that life is going to continue. Death does not put the soul in the tomb. The body is that which occupies a portion of of God's green footstool, and the Spirit continues to live. We know from the Old Testament that they knew about the next life. It is said of Abraham that he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I'm fond of an expression that is found a number of times, especially in the early part of the Bible, namely when a righteous man dies, the Bible speaks about gathering himself or herself unto her own people or his own people. This is affirmed of Abraham, it is affirmed of Isaac, it is affirmed of Jacob. In regard to Abraham and Sarah, their bodies were not buried in the old burial grounds from Ur of Chaldees from which they came. Their bodies were entombed in the cave of Machpelah in the southern part of Palestine. They were gathered unto their people. We know where Abraham was gathered. He was gathered to a place that within the New Testament will be known as Abraham's bosom. Jesus will refer to that person as being paradise as one of the statements that he made from the cross of Calvary. And so the soul continues to live. I do not believe that the righteous soul goes directly to heaven, though some brethren think that it does. I do not believe that the unrighteous soul goes immediately to hell. And I base that upon a number of passages of Scripture, one of which I've already quoted. The Apostle Paul suggested in 2 Timothy 4, 8 that he expected to receive the crown of righteousness the same time that other saints would receive theirs. But all the saints who lived before him and who would live subsequent to him, they did not receive their reward of heaven the day that Rome put him to death. Another means of coming to that conclusion is found in the teaching of Jesus in Luke, the 16th chapter. He talked, about the, he talked about the death of Lazarus, who had been a poor beggar, but now rich in the next world. He talked about the unnamed rich man who lived sumptuously and very elegantly in this world, clothed in the finest of apparel of his day, but he couldn't even earn or couldn't even receive a cup or a, a drop of water for his tormented tongue in the Hadean realm. 
Hades is used a number of times in the New Testament. It refers to the realm of the departed spirits. And this is exactly where Jesus went. We know from what he said to Mary Magdalene that he had not yet ascended to his father. In fact, it would be another 40 days after he made this statement to, to Mary that he would ascend to the Father on high. And yet, from the time that he died on Friday until he arose from the dead, triumphant over the tomb the following Sunday morning, he spoke about himself as going into paradise. Remember, one of the thieves, either on his right or left, came to a penitent position, requested of the Lord, Remember me when thou comest unto thy kingdom. He evidently realized some things about the kingdom that even the closest of the disciples had not yet begun to realize. But Jesus made a promise to the penitent thief. He said, today shall thou be with me in paradise. That which Luke, the beloved physician, calls Abraham's bosom, Luke 16, is that which Jesus called paradise. They mean one and the same. Paradise is a place of pleasure. Certainly it can be applied to heaven and is applied to heaven, but also to the realm of departed spirits. And so the Bible teaches us that the soul of the righteous will begin to receive comfort and be free of any pain in the realm that is known as Abraham's bosom or the place of paradise. But the journey is not completed at that point. Because come judgment day, the assembled universe will appear before the great judge of the quick and the dead. One group will hear, depart from me, you wicked, ye cursed, I never knew you. I never placed any recognition upon you. And to the others, he will say, well done, thou good and faithful servants. You've been faithful to me, and I will make thee ruler over many things. We read about these golden welcome words in Matthew, the 25th chapter. They will be told upon that day, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And so the ultimate of our journey as Christians, as sons and daughters of God, is that which we know as heaven, the home of the soul, the ultimate home of the soul. And there are so many golden treasures and golden glimpses of glory that are set forth in the Bible about this wonderful realm above. It is spoken of as being a real place. There was a religious leader in the past who said heaven is not a place, it's simply a state of mind. But Jesus referred to it as a place. From that place he had come and to that place he was going to go back after spending a third of a century here upon the earth. In fact, in John the 14th chapter, one of the most beautiful and one of the most descriptive set of words that we have about heaven reads this way. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Not only that, but heaven is described as a better country. In fact, the Bible tells us in that great chapter of faith, Hebrews the 11th chapter, that people now, these people about whom he's describing, but now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. So talked about that better place, that enduring place that we have in the great by and by. Not only that, but the Bible teaches that it will be a place of rest to every person that is known Fatigue, being tired, being exhausted, this is a wonderful glimpse of glory. Jesus in the present, uh, the precious invitation said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. Twice he uses the word rest. It's been my conviction for many years that the first rest refers to that which we enjoy as a spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And the second one, I cannot help but believe that this is a reference to heavenly rest. 
Brother Boone Dathod and I, back in the early 50s, were called to a town in Middle Tennessee to conduct the funeral of a saintly Christian woman. She had lived a long and faithful life, and according to one of the members of the family who talked to me the day of the funeral, this member of the family said, our loved one recently said, I am tired and I want to go home. She wasn't talking about the humble home in which she had lived most of her life. That's where she died. She was looking across the years, across perhaps the centuries of the future, until she would be rewarded with a heavenly home. She looked upon it as a place of rest. Not only that, but heaven is spoken of as being a city not a city that is filled with corruption and crime and dishonesty, violence and crimes of all kind. Heaven is spoken of as being a place of peace. Heaven is a place where there will not be any abomination. Heaven is a place where there will not be any kind of evil. Heaven is a place where envy will not be welcome. Heaven is a place where sickness will not be. In Revelation 21 and 4, we read how that that same almighty hand that once reached into a vast nothing and created a sparkling world, a universe in which his people could live, will, will take away all tears, wiping away the tears from the eyes of his children. There shall be no more death. There shall be no more sorrow. There shall be no pain. There shall be no more sickness. These are among what I like to think about, the land of the no mores. And we read about a number of these in Revelation 21 and Revelation 22. Not only that, but heaven will be a place of fellowship. We enjoy the sweetest of fellowship, and so much of it is enjoyed in this lectureship each spring of the year. But, if, but fellowship in the heavenly realm, I'm sure, will eclipse anything that we've ever experienced in a local congregation, in a lectureship, in a gospel meeting, in any kind of seminar that's designed to increase and deepen our faith. We will have fellowship with the Father. We will be able to see him face to face. And the Bible talks about that in Revelation, the 21st chapter. Not only will we have fellowship with the one to whom our prayers have been addressed, the one who designed the wonderful scheme of human redemption, the one who loved the sinful universe so much that he parted with his only begotten son for a third of a century, allowing him to suffer as he did suffer, to be crucified as he was crucified, and to hear from his own son, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27 and verse 1. Fellowship will be with the Father on high. We've sung to him. We've prayed to him. We've praised him. We've glorified him. And ultimately, the journey will end around his throne. We will have the wonderful fellowship of his son. How wonderful it must have been for Mother Mary as she cradled within her arms of love and affection that little bundle of heavenly joy that had been sent to her and sent to the entire world. How she must have loved him as he matured, as he went through his teenage years, and then at the end of his third century or third decade upon the earth, she saw him leave Nazareth, go and seek baptism at the hands of John the Immerser, and then to engage in a wonderful and victorious mission some three or three and one half years. And just as it was prophesied early in the Lord in the Lord's life, there would be something that would bring her great pain that must have reached fulfillment as she saw her own son die the death upon cruel, cold, callous cross, the cross of Calvary. And then seeing him depart, or rather knowing that he would depart soon after he arose from the dead. And yet there was a time when she had him and a time when she had to give him up. It must have been wonderful to have been his apostle to have heard the wonderful words of life that proceeded so elegantly and eloquently from the lips of their master. 
It must have been wonderful for Paul and others who belonged to the Christian faith in the first century to enjoy the fellowship of Jesus here upon the earth. And yet that was limited. There came a time when he would be lifted from the apostles on the Mount of Olives and they would watch him with gazing eyes indeed intent upon seeing him to the very last until a cloud hid him from their presence. What a wonderful joy it will be. What a period of great fellowship, grand and good and glorious fellowship to be in the presence of the Holy Spirit that per person of the Godhead that has often been so misrepresented and so misunderstood by religious people all over the world and to be in his presence, recognizing that he's the one that uh, inspired the scriptures. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, Second Peter 1 and verse 21. But think of the wonderful fellowship with all of the redeemed from patriarchal time. Jesus assures us in Matthew 8, 11, and 12 that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be in the kingdom. And then in the parallel section by Luke, we find that the prophets will be in the kingdom of heaven. This is the heavenly kingdom. And then to be with all of the faithful and patriarchal times in the Mosaic dispensation and now in the Christian dispensation. What a joy, what a wonderful joy it will be. That will be fellowship in the fullest of sin. To be able to enjoy the fellowship of little children. And I've loved little children, little babies all the days of my life. And I shared that with so many of you also. I do not know, I do not understand, I cannot perceive of how people can take a life from the womb as doctors and nurses have been doing in millions and millions of cases since the early 1970s. There are those even within the religious realm who consistently with their Calvinism have to say they're going to be babies in hell not a span long because there are no non-elect men and women that die unless they were non-elect babies at the time of their birth. And according to that rotten religious doctrine, there will be these non-elect babies in hell. Not a single one of them will be there. Every child that has ever been born and dies before reaching the age of accountability, the responsible age, will be in heaven without the loss of a single one. David knew that when he gave up his infant son. I cannot bring him back, but I can go to him. I preach the funerals of many, many babies, some dying almost as soon as they were born. I never have any hesitation in saying, your little loved one that's been snatched away from you, you're going to see him in heaven if you live the right kind of life, knowing that that child is going to be in ultimately the heaven of heavens above. And then all of the ones who have been our friends, all the ones who have been our loved ones, I never have been of the procession perception rather, that we will not know anyone in, anyone in heaven. I came to know a man in Mississippi a number of years ago. He said, I do not believe that we will recognize our loved ones in heaven. He said, if I did, knowing that some of them are not going to be there, I think it would produce great sadness within my soul. I pointed out to him, you don't love those loved ones nearly as much as the father did, and he's going to be happy throughout eternity, even though some of these have not lived and died in that most holy faith. And I've always been of the persuasion that we'll know fathers and mothers, that we'll know wives and children, that we'll know those great and glorious grandchildren. We've known them here upon the earth. There will be identity <clears throat> that we will possess in that wonderful realm. And Abraham's going to be Abraham. Isaac's going to be Isaac. Jacob's going to be Jacob. Joseph's going to be Joseph. Paul will be Paul. And I believe Robert will be Robert. Irene will be Irene. And you will be the person that you have lived here upon the earth and with whom you have associated. What a wonderful realm we have whenever the journey is completed.
but it has to be begun with faithful obedience to the gospel. It has to be sustained by a continuing faith, a faith that does not give up, a faith that does, does not surrender to unbelief and infidelity. If you're here tonight and if you never obeyed the gospel, why not hear the truth as it's been set forth throughout this lectureship, believing from the depths of your soul and from your holy heart, or heart that will be holy when you obey the gospel, that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, that you'll repent of every sin that now mars the face of God from you, and after that repentance, confess the name that is the sweetest on mortal tongue, and be immersed in water for the remission of your sins. God also has a gracious Second law of pardon, knowing that we would not live lives of sinless perfection after obedience to the gospel, and he provides a way for us to be forgiven of our sins as an erring child of his. That's exactly what Peter meant when he said to the erring Simon, repent and pray, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. John had that in mind in 1 John, the first chapter. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So did James in James 5 and 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you knew that today would be your last day upon the earth, the last night, the last opportunity that you might have to obey the gospel, what would your answer be? Let us stand and sing. <laughs>